Freedom Life Church Online. What's going on? We're excited to have you join us here today. I want to cover a couple of things on how you can stay engaged with us throughout this service. One thing I want you to know about is our chat box. We have hosts that are standing by ready to get to know you. You can take notes and email them to yourself afterwards. Follow along with our Bible, any scriptures that are used. We got live prayer that you can go into a private room and speak with someone privately about any needs that are upon your heart. Our desire is that you feel like the Freedom Life family because that's exactly who you are. So right now, without any further ado, we're excited to see what God has planned today. So this is such a, a, a very special occasion. This is Kabir, this is Noah, and this is Mary. And so you guys make a ton of noise for them. Amen, amen, amen. So they're getting baptized this morning. So we're going to pray as we get ready to worship. Lord, thank you so much that you give us an opportunity for, for do-overs. And even beyond that, God, you have a plan for our lives. Lord, I just pray that we would uh, worship you today, that our posture would be on our knees even though we're standing. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Freedom Life Church, if you're glad to be in God's house, can I hear you give our God a good clap and a good shout of praise in this place? Let's go. Let me see your hands right here.
declare that there's no name that's higher than yours. And because you are consistent, because you are never changing, because you are always there, Father, because you heal us, because you restore us, Father, because you cover us, because you protect us, Father, today we declare that we love you. And Father, we trust you. Father, we trust you.
love you. You're my strength. And Father, I will love you. Because you're my shield. And I will love you. Because you're my rock. just pray and invite just God to continue to minister his presence to us. Can we do that? What a powerful morning to celebrate baptisms, to celebrate his presence. But what a powerful reminder that, that we cannot go beyond his grace. We cannot go outside of his ability to meet us and hold us together. And so I'm just going to pray for us real quick. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person who's in this room, every person who's joining us online around the world father god we ask in the name of jesus that right now heaven would invade earth father god we ask as we lay our hearts before you god as we invite you to do what only you could do to show up in a way that only you can lord i pray in jesus name for your mercy your power and grace to be made strong lord i pray that as we gather that the words of our mouth the meditations of our heart would bring honor to your kingdom Honor to your legacy, honor to your name, honor to your church, honor to the God who is close to the broken heart, the God who delivers, the God who is the strong tower that the righteous might run in and be set free, be saved, Father God. I pray this morning, Lord God, that we would realize that in you is our strength, in you is our help, in you is our refuge, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. I have longed to be with y'all. <laughs> yeah. I have longed to be here. I missed you guys. Um, it's been a tough week. I don't know how else to say that. Uh, that may be an understatement of the year. Who knows? <laughs> Um, but I know this, I know that God is moving and God is on the throne and God is in control. I know that. 
I know that you have no idea the place that you hold in my heart. I know that you uh, will not fully understand, probably in this lifetime, short of heaven, uh, the strength that you have ministered to me as your senior pastor, and I'm grateful for that. I truly am. I, I love you. Thank you. I, lo I love you. I'm just going to go ahead and grab these now, just in case. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, we... Um, Last week, I, I, we ended the service with me sharing a video with you guys, and I, I am very well aware of the fact that not everybody who goes to our church comes every week, and I am well aware of the fact that there might be some folks that are in this room that are kind of new to a situation that has transpired in our church uh, in the past uh, week, and so I also am well aware that some of y'all were just here to watch your friend get baptized, and you're like, man, uh, I'm just here to support, you know, my friend, and so... I. I'm going to invite you into something that, that is, is an awkward experience, and for any church, it's an awkward journey, but it's real. And the way, what you should know about our church is that, that we handle things uh, in grace, but also in truth. We are a church that stands for what we preach. We are a church that stands in righteousness, but does not throw people away. Uh, we are a church that doesn't brush stuff under the rug. We are a church that cares more about the kingdom than about the local news. We are a church that cares more about redemption than about the easy decision to wash our hands clean of situations that are ugly and just move on without. That's not the church that you stepped into and not the church you visited. You visited a church <clears throat> that is vulnerable and transparent in our brokenness and in our strength. You visited a church where you will hear things that, that are real, things that are uncomfortable, you have visited a church this morning, or maybe you've been a part of a church, uh, where we will not sacrifice the standard of morality for talent, for preaching skill, for musical ability. You're at a church this morning that values integrity and commitment to the truth over all things. And so in that, there are moments where we as a church have to deal with stuff. And this is one of those moments for us. And so if you're new, if you're a guest, if you're visiting again, I know what it's like to be at somebody else's house and something's going on. You're like, oh, my gosh, I just came over for dinner. Uh, so I get it. I've been there. And uh, so just invite you to pray for us. But hopefully in today, you will see the heartbeat of a church that truly wants to live this thing out. We truly want to be a church that stands for truth, but also stands with people. I hope that's what you hear this morning. Uh, last week, if you missed it or if you don't know at all what I'm talking about, I'll just be very clear. And I'll try to give you as brief of a, um, a rundown on that as I can because I want to move forward. But I need to deal with what's going on so that you understand it before we move forward into what God has shown me since and what's to come. So um, a couple weeks ago, I was invited into a conversation where there was a young lady, and I need to clear this up too. I owe one person an apology, and I'm going to apologize to her by name. Uh, let me just say first that I, some allegations were brought forward to one of our elders from a young lady in our congregation um, involving uh, allegations about behaviors that had transpired uh, with our lead pastor of our San Antonio campus, Courtney Beard. Uh, and we shared through this in the video that I shared with you as I w had to get on an airplane and fly to San Antonio unplanned. I bought a one-way ticket because I didn't know how long I would have to be there. And I just knew I needed to walk our campus through, through something. I needed to sit down with my brother. Uh, and if you don't know anything about Courtney, I should tell you that he's my best friend. That I've known him for 14 years. Uh, we've been able to do ministry together for seven or eight of those years. And that he is one of very few people in my life that I would describe as more than a friend but a brother. Um, one of my brothers is, is here today. My brother Jason is sitting with us. And, and he could tell you that sometimes on a, a, annual Brothers Day, I, I will mention the fact that I have three brothers. I have my older brother Jason, my little brother James, and my little big brother Courtney. And so I just want you to know that, that the place that he holds in my heart and that this doesn't change any of that. But a young lady came forward and um, said that some things had happened between them and some things that had transpired and that she had been um, trying to carry this by herself. 
And what changed it was that about six weeks ago, I stood in front of this congregation and I said, as we preached about the role of women in the church and how we affirm women, we have woman elder, we have women teaching pastor, we, we believe and we stand with our women and we will be a place that honors women. And I asked you, I said, if you ever see any of us conducting ourselves in a way that does not back that up, then I need you to tell me about it because we will do something about it. She happened to be here that day, and so she, she reached out to one of our elders, and she shared what she had been going through in 2016 and 2017 and how she had kept that to herself, unsure, one, if she would be believed, two, um, you know, she didn't want to bring harm to the church, and, and three, she didn't want to bring harm to Courtney in, in the ministry and all these things that were going on. But the allegations involved immoral behavior. They involved things that pastors should not do. They involved a violation of the code that I stand in front of you and promise you that we're not going to get up here and preach something that we're not living first. And I hold that serious. So I got on a plane. I flew down and I sat with my brother on last Wednesday morning, this past Wednesday, at a hotel. And he and I and the elder and a third party that we brought in, uh, an HR, uh, the head of HR for the chapel, my mentor pastor's church, that I asked to be there to make sure we could conduct this in the safest and best way for everybody involved, uh, sat with us. And I read these allegations to my friend, my brother. And in that moment, he looked at me and he said, you know, can I just stop and tell you that when we are confronted with a moment like that, we all have a decision how we're going to respond to it. And I will tell you, without hesitation, he looked at me and he said, Freddie, it's all true. It's all true. Now I've had about a week and a half to process that, and I know some of you are hearing it for the first time. And I honor that. And as he said that to me, I immediately re realized a couple things. First of all, I realized that he needs help. Secondly, I realized that there was a young lady that we all owe a huge debt of gratitude to because she was brave enough to trust the leadership of this church instead of believing the lie that she would not be heard. I will say that young lady was not Laveda Hines, and I should have said that last week. Laveda is someone who's been very close to the Beard family, and in, in addition to everything else that she's having to process with them in this, she was also began to receive phone calls wondering if it was her that was involved in this. And so, Leveda, I want to publicly apologize to you that in addition to all the other emotions you had to deal with, I did not give clarity to the fact that it had nothing to do with you, and I'm sorry. I can't take that back, but I promised you, and I promise you, I will clear that up right now. And so if anybody knows Leveda, I just need you to hear from me. This did not involve her. It was not a part of, uh, she was not a part of it, but obviously it has affected her just as it affected everybody else. Last week in San Antonio when I stood with Courtney and we shared this live, I made sure to make certain that people understood that this involved someone who had never been a part of the San Antonio campus. In the video that was played last week, that was not edited. It was raw. It was me in my hotel room pouring my heart out to you. It was unscripted, and I failed to leave out one detail that may seem minor to some of you, but it is huge to Leveda, and it, she should not have experienced that, and for that I'm sorry. But I need to clear that up. I also want to clear up because in the wake of this, some people have sent questions which are appropriate to leadership, which are appropriate. And they ask things about the nature of this. And I will say this to you. Nothing illegal transpired, but what happened was immoral. And I'm not going to get into the details of everything that happened and how and why. The fact is I don't need to. I have a, a friend who looked at me and said it's true, and I'm willing to give myself to whatever it takes to be transformed. I get it. I know what admitting this means. I realize that I am going to be removed from ministry, but at this point, I want to rescue my marriage. I want to fix who I am because I know God has something more for me. So we talked, a lot of tears were shed. In fact, I've shed more tears this past week than I thought my tear ducts could produce. I'm not kidding. At one point, I thought I was drinking water just to provide the next round of tears. And in the middle of all this, um, there's, a, there's, there's some people that were deeply impacted. Our church has fully given ourselves 
to helping this young lady through her journey. We are there for her. Uh, we are, have, my wife and I have given her full access to our life, and one of our elders, Carrie Pollock, has been talking with her daily, and I want you to know we are doing everything we can to help a young lady who felt trapped and isolated and alone in something that she should never have felt alone in, and she had never, actually should never have been exposed to being a part of. She, had, she, she is on our heart. In the midst of this, we stood in front of the San Antonio campus last week, and I sat in a room full of people watching their hero die. I cannot tell you the gravity of that moment, and I won't forget it the rest of my life, but I can tell you what my brother did. I can tell you, and some of it you are very bothered by the fact that I am referring to him still as my brother. I'm referring because I know that inside that man there may be some very deep, there is some deep brokenness, but I also know that he still matters to the kingdom of God. He still matters to me. Courtney is still my brother. He is still my friend. I know that that may be hard to hear for some of us, but I need you to know something about us and about me. We don't throw people away. If that bothers you, I would be glad to meet with you and give you a list of other churches that you might want to visit. But I refuse to pastor a church that throws people away. And part of the why that is is because there was a time in my life when I was in that seat. I was that guy. So as you consider how you're going to think or feel about his transgression, let me invite you into mine. When I was 19 years old, I was in training for ministry. I was the youth pastor of a church in Newport News. And at the same time, I was dealing with a deep brokenness inside of myself. And that brokenness led me to try to engage in sexual activity with every adult good-looking female in the congregation, and I, try, I was the wolf in sheep's clothing. I was given the authority of the pulpit. I was given the authority of leadership in the church, yet there was a deep, wounded brokenness in me that related to women for my own gratification with the justification that as long as we were not fully engaging in intercourse, then somehow, some way, that was okay and that, that God could continue to use me to minister to these kids. I had the audacity to preach to the teenagers of my youth group about sexual purity while I was relating to the adults in my church very differently. And I justified it inside because of my own brokenness until there was a moment when God grabbed a hold of my heart and said, we're done with that. At the age of 19, I came crawling to the altar, and I found my pastor before church started, and I said, Pastor, I've got something that i got to get off my chest, and we were about to start church. He said, I'll meet you in my office after service. I said, no problem. So I went to his office, and I sat. I remember laying on the floor in my pastor's office, weeping and with snot pouring out of my nose, and, te- and I don't know how long, but I remember at some point, my pastor finished up church, walked into that office, and he didn't say anything. He got on the ground and he held me in his arms like a child and he wept with me not even knowing why I was weeping until I could form the words to confess to him what I had done and what he said next changed my life first he said Freddie I love you second he said Because I love you, you are no longer a minister of this church. You are removed from the ministry and the staff of this church. And then the third thing he says is, but but because I love you, I will walk with you through every step of this journey. And one day, you will be on the other side of this. But I won't give up on you, so you don't give up on me. For the next year of my life, he did exactly what he offered. And the elders of that church made themselves available to me. I was not available to the church, but they were available to me. And what came out of that was a man who was transformed, a man who understood his identity differently, a man who was willing to trust uh, that God had done something that I would not have experienced had he not exposed that. And because that happened when I was 19 and 20 years old, at the age of 41, I can stand before you today as your senior pastor. We don't give up on people. (laughs) 
So as I looked at my best friend and fired him, I knew it's exactly what had to be done. I'm 100% certain that decision was essential, not just for him, for the congregation, for his marriage, for all involved. I know that he is not, at this point in his life, qualified for ministry. Because there's a deepness in him that needs to be healed. But I also know that he has given himself fully to that process. I know that he stood in front of our San Antonio campus last week. And he publicly apologized to first his Lord and Savior. And then he apologized to his wife who stood with him and said, I am with you through this. And then he apologized to the leadership of this church and to myself. And then he apologized to all of you and to all the people that he has let down in San Antonio. He did not shrink back. He did not leave room for peddling or for softening. He stood like a man does when a man is exposed. And he said, I am the one. I have sinned. And I am giving myself to this process. That's the friend that I have. It doesn't change what happened. That's why we give ourselves fully to this young lady. That's why we give ourselves fully. That's why you're not ever going to hear who she is. Because now she has to walk through the awkwardness of being in a church surrounded by people who know a part of her story but don't know her journey. That's why you're never going to get that list that was given to us that he affirmed because it's none of your business, frankly. <laughs> what is your business is that we need to do this together, that we will walk through this together, that we're going to cover this with prayer. And if you want to talk about my friend, if you want to talk about this young lady, make sure you're talking to God because you're praying for them instead of gossiping about them. You know, um, my prayer in all this has been that this be a defining moment for our church. That this be a defining moment for some of you and some of your marriages and some of your personal lives and your personal journeys. I absolutely believe that in my life there has been a handful of defining moments. And some of us are bystanders in those moments. Some of us have experienced things that we would never choose for ourselves. Some of us in those defining moments didn't sign up for the ride we found ourselves on. We don't always get to decide what happens to us, but in the defining moments of our life, we always decide how we're going to respond to them. Freedom Life, this is a defining moment that we didn't sign up for. This is a defining moment we couldn't forecast, but we as a church will decide how we respond to it. And I will tell you how we aren't going to respond to it. We aren't going to sacrifice Courtney and his family on the altar of embarrassment so that we can somehow try to scrape together some dignity of integrity and trust in our leadership. That's why I'm sharing what I am and I'm not sharing what I'm not. What we won't sacrifice either is the integrity of this pulpit. We are not the church that can overlook transgression because of the gift that someone brings. That is poisonous to the person and it is poisonous to the kingdom. We do not brush stuff under the rug in this church. I refuse to lead a church that we don't stand with integrity to declare God's word. I've told you before and I'll say it again. I'm not going to ask you to live something that I'm not willing to live myself. I'm not going to preach it if I can't live it. I won't. And if you're a pastor, you're watching right now, if you're a, if you're a, you're a pastor joining us, if you're, if you're someone who, who knows someone in ministry, can I just tell you, if you are in ministry, please guard the integrity of your life. It costs too much. I once heard Craig O'Shell at a conference in Atlanta talking about his son playing with a baby rattlesnake. And he said that, that where he lived out in Oklahoma, there's these little snakes. And, and he, he saw his son playing with what he thought was a worm. And then he discovered it was a baby rattlesnake. And his dad was like, I mean, his son said, Dad, look at my pet. And he took that thing and he threw it on the ground and he killed it. Because what you might not realize is even though it's a baby, baby rattlesnakes are actually more harmful to the human body than full-grown rattlesnakes. 
because they eat different things than full-grown rattlesnakes. Full-grown rattlesnakes will eat little mammals and rats and rodents, but baby rattlesnakes eat lizards. And so they actually have a more a, a different type of neurotoxin in their venom so that it can actually decompose things like reptiles. And it's actually more potent and more destructive than a full-grown rattlesnake. The other thing is a baby rattlesnake doesn't have the control over how much venom will, will be released like an adult rattlesnake has. So when a baby bat, rattles, rattlesnake bites, not only does it do so with more poison, it does so with more toxicity. And, and, and the reality is some of us are growing baby rattlesnakes in our our life and we think it's fine because it's just a little thing it's just a little habit it's just something that no one else knows about it's not that big of a deal I know there's danger there but I've got it under control that rattlesnake will kill you we're in a moment that typically um, destroys churches I just want to be upfront about that scandals around money around Sexuality, immorality, things involving pastoral misconduct, inappropriate use of authority. Those are the kind of things that causes people to lose trust in the church. That's why the world out there looks at us and says, man, y'all ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. The church is a joke. Can I just tell you that, that the way we respond, I believe, in moments like this is going to be what defines the legacy and the nature of what God can do and can't do through our church. I mean, the world does not need another excuse to look at the church and say it's a joke. We haven't even caught up with Jim Crow laws being abolished. Now, I know I say that sitting in a room full of Different ages and races, and and and, 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 and may, but let me tell you, you don't have to drive very far from here to realize the body of Christ in our city is still 50 years behind the the colleges and the restaurants and the bars. So we have no voice in social justice because we're too busy talking about just us. This is another area where there's so much scandal. You know what I, gave me life that just breathed encouragement that literally kept me from just falling to pieces over the past week? That I get the privilege of serving in a church that I knew was with me. That I get the privilege of serving in a church that didn't run to social media with scandal. They ran to each other in prayer. That my inbox was flooded with people from this church and all across our campuses saying thank you for reminding me that my church is a safe place for women who've been through what I've been through. Thank you for giving voice to something that I was told to be quiet about at some point in my life. The body, I will, we will live or we will die being what God's called us to be and I'm good either way. I would rather pastor a church of four people doing what God told us to do than 4,000 people who tolerate Things that should not be tolerated. I believe we have the opportunity now more than ever to stand as the body of Christ and say this is how the body of Christ handles things like this. This is how the kingdom of God operates. Why? Because we have a God who does not give up on us. We are not a church who shoots our wounded. I've been in those churches. We don't shoot our wounded, but you know what? We also don't leave them on the front line to slowly bleed to death. We don't leave them up there just because how good they sing. Hey, we know you got a gaping chest wound, but if you could just do one more response song, we'd really appreciate it. That is not the kingdom of God. That is using people to build the church, and we use the church to build people. So as we walk through all this, I want to remind you, if I could, I know typically my sermons are saturated with Scripture, and I, I have been giving myself to Scripture, but I really felt the Lord say what needs to happen in this moment is that I could just share my heart with you and then share with you the passage of Scripture that's held me together through all this. But as I've done a survey of Scripture, I've realized that God has a very intentional process in the way he builds his kingdom. 
Because every single person in this room, including the person you're staring at with a microphone right now, is a human being. Which means we still deal with our own flesh and our own brokenness and our own uh, predisposition to do things that are not honoring to God. Which is why we need accountability. Which is why we need healing. Which is why we need to make sure I am not ministering out of brokenness, but out of what God has delivered me from. Because the moment that I need you instead of choose you, I have become a toxic leader I don't need you and you shouldn't need me you need Jesus and so do I but I choose you and I choose to give myself to you I choose to give myself to this calling I choose to give myself to the kingdom and it's out of being healed and made whole that we can then give ourselves in a whole way to other people. But you know, that's the journey of all of Scripture. If I could just give you just a, just a summary that we serve the same God who looked at a man named Abram and exposed, he exposed Abram as a liar in Egypt. He got, ex he got kicked out of a country. I've never been kicked out of a country. I've come close on a cruise in the Bahamas, but that's a long story. And it's probably different than what you're thinking. Let's just say I cut in line in customs to not miss my cruise. But you know what? Abram got exposed as a liar before God could make his legacy the man of faith. Did you catch that? The man of faith had to be exposed, walk through wilderness, and then God creates legacy. We can go further. Abraham, had, he had a son named Isaac who had a son named Jacob. Jacob was exposed as a manipulator and a finagler, even trying to wrestle with God himself before his identity could be changed to Israel, who became a mighty nation that showed the world what it's like to have covenant with God. Moses. Remember Moses? Moses. 40 years old, murdered somebody in anger. He spent the next 40 years in the wilderness hiding, tending to Jethro's flock. You notice that there's an exposure when someone looked at Moses and said, you're a murderer. If I make you mad, are you going to murder me the way you murdered that Egyptian guard? And all of a sudden his sin is laid bare and Moses fled into the wilderness. Can I tell you there's a reason God exposes and then deals with us in the wilderness. Because there are things that have to die in the wilderness before we can experience the promise. For 40 years, Moses is in the wilderness tending to Jethro's sheep. And it tells us that he was in the wilderness leading the flocks of Jethro across the wilderness to the mountain of God. 40 years he's in his wilderness. And one day God shows up in the burning bush. Why? Because he needed to find a man who had gone through the process of going from a murderer to a shepherd. God picked a murderer to be a shepherd, and he said, I need someone who's going to lead my flock through the wilderness to the mountain of God for 40 years. Who better to, who better to pick than the man who has spent the last 40 years preparing for the job? I could go on and on. I could talk about Joseph and his pride and then being rejected by his brothers and thrown into a pit, then into a prison, and from the prison to the palace, I could go on and on talk. I could tell you about David, who is, whose David's legacy is that he was a man after God's own heart, but before that became his legacy, his sin of adultery with Bathsheba was exposed. God had to bring to light that which was hidden so that the heart could be dealt with, so that the wound could be popped open and it could be cleaned out. And all that would be left is a scar, a scar that points to the goodness of a God who rescues us from ourselves. David's legacy is not that he had adult an affair with Bathsheba. His legacy, every time you hear about him in the rest of the New Testament, in the Bible, it's that he was a man after God's own heart. But before he could be that man, God had to fix his heart. Exposed. Not to be thrown away. But to be redeemed. Right now, one of our 
former pastors has been exposed. But like David, when confronted, he said, I am the man, and I have done what has been said, and I want to change. When we have those moments, how we respond to them makes all the difference. Saul, in the New Testament, was a Pharisee breathing out murderous threats against the church. The Lord met him on the road to Damascus, literally blinded his eyes, exposed his sin. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then he took the scales off his eyes and he healed this man's identity. And that very Saul who breathed out murderous threats became a man who wrote loving letters that became two-thirds of the word that we now preach. That's the God I serve. The God that meets us in our brokenness. The God who walks us through our wilderness. And the God who delivers us into promise. So what do we do when we're in the moment? What do we do right now? What do we do as we have to try to navigate all these things that are spinning in our thoughts, in our mind, in our hearts. All the stuff that we thought we had dealt with years ago. And now we find ourselves in another church where something has happened. And all these things from our past get stirred up because that's been happening. We invite God to meet us in that. That's what we do. This past week has been one of the hardest weeks I've ever lived in 21 years of ministry. I know the decision was right. I didn't lose sleep over that. You know what I lost sleep over? I lost over, sleep over this young lady who was brave enough to come forward in the journey that's in front of her and how we as a church will be with her. I lost sleep over Quinetta, Courtney's wife. I lost sleep over the tears and the faces I saw at the San Antonio campus. I lost sleep over my best friend, Courtney. I lost sleep over a lot of things. I did not lose sleep over the decision that was made. But I lost sleep over how the enemy tries to use us to destroy. And I gave myself to prayer. And God gave me a word. And if I could share the one word, that, that the one scripture that God has given me to just rest on this week. It goes all the way back to 2 Kings. And in 2 Kings, we find a man named Elisha. And Elisha is God's prophet in the Old Testament after Elijah. And Elisha has been helping the nation of Israel while they're at war. And they're in a battle, a real battle. And, and the king of Aram is continuing to try to find ways to destroy. He's continuing to try and find ways to overwhelm God's nation. But this is what God does. He raises up a voice in the wilderness to prepare the people of God to avoid the trap of the enemy and he's still doing it and this has been life to my soul and could I just share with you this passage 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 8 it says now the king of Aram was at war with Israel after conferring with his officers he said I will set up my camp in such and such place now that's not slang that's actually what the Bible says <clears throat> over yonder no that's not what it a man, the man of God, that's Elisha, the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time was against, I'm sorry, time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram because all his ambushes are getting exposed. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Sidebar. That's something to keep in mind. Because right now we're talking very publicly about something that affected a whole church, which is why we have to do so. But least you feel the need to go talking about it with your own opinion and thoughts. Remember, you serve a God who knows the conversations you have in your bedroom. And I just wonder if all of us were in a position of influence that requires accountability. And the story of our own life and brokenness had to be told. Because of the situation that we were placed in and trusted in. I wonder how the story would be different. Let me just leave you with that. 
I'm grateful for the grace of God. And I'm grateful that I serve a church that is committed to grace. Let me go back to the story. Go and find out where he is, the king ordered. So I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he's in Dothan. Then the king sent horses and chariots and, and strong forces there. And they went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God, that his name is Gehazi. And the only reason we know that is because in chapter 5 it tells us his name. But I'm going to just keep reading and explain that to you. The servant of the man of God, Gehazi, got, got up the... And, and went out early the next morning, an army, uh, when, when he got up, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Now, sometimes we can read the Bible without fully understanding context. So let me give you a little context here. Oh, no! <laughs> My Lord! What it, the heck are we going to do? The servant asked. He was just going to get the paper. And he realizes we are surrounded by the enemy. There are horses. There are chariots. There are soldiers. But all the way, he said surrounded. I don't know if you've ever been surrounded by something, but everywhere you look, there it is. He runs back into the house. What are we going to do? Elisha's like, you forgot the paper. No, he didn't say that. But look what he does say. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Time out. Elisha's in a house. Gehazi went outside. Ran back in the house. Elisha is sitting at the table, sipping some tea. If you've ever wondered when a pastor is giving you the promise of God and you've ever sat there and said, but you don't understand the reality of my perspective, maybe it's because that pastor has a perspective in something they have seen that you have yet to see. Maybe they're not minimizing or they're not just trying to tell you it's all going to be okay. You know what? You just pick up that Bible and just thank God. This is my Bible. You just smile. Can I tell you there's a reason some people have that posture of life? Because God has given insight into something that is much more real than anything we can look at on this earth. He looks at this man. He says, hey, those who are with us are greater than those who are against us. Don't worry. Verse 17, and Elisha prayed. Man, this is my prayer that we would be a people who pray before we talk. Could we be a church that prays before we post? Could we be a church that prays before, and I'm not talking about, oh, I need to talk to you because we need to be praying for so-and-so. May we be a people who seek God's perspective before we respond to what we think is real. He prayed, and what was his prayer? Open Gehazi's eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, the other team had chariots, but they didn't have no chariots on fire. The other team had an army, but they didn't have an army of angels. They didn't have an army that is sent by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, uh, the heavenly hosts that wage war on behalf of the people of God. You know, a few weeks ago I heard a song in San Antonio. Before any of this came to light and God gave me a word and it's a song symbol. It might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And as I was listening to that song, God put this word in my heart. And I actually shared this with the people of FLC San Antonio. I said, God has given me a word for this campus. Little did we know that two weeks later I would be on that same stage walking them through what we're walking through right now. But God had a word of preparation for those who will listen. It might look like we're surrounded, but we're surrounded by him. 
my brother Jason is here this morning. Yesterday, I was at my house. I had re was reading through this for probably the 11th or 15th time this week. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, God said, he said, said, said something to me. He said, I want you to go look at what the name Gehazi means. I want you to go look at their names because names are significant in the Old Testament. And I thought, <clears throat> okay, I, I know the scripture. I know the passage. I've been walking through it. But he said, go look at the names. So I had this aha moment. And I'm lying there like, oh, man, that's awesome. Oh, my gosh, that's so good. Thank you, God. My brother comes running in from the kitchen. He's like, what's this? Oh, God, it's so good. What, what, what's going on with you? I said, you have to wait till the sermon to find out. No, I didn't say that to him. <laughs> but I was just having a real-time moment because God showed me how these names of these two men really are significant in how we decide how to respond to moments like this. You see, Gehazi, <clears throat> his name means... Valley of vision. And as I started praying about that, I started to realize something. When you're in the valley, what do you see? What is your vision in the valley? When you hit a low place, and the lower it gets, the lower it feels. What gets bigger? What gets bigger in the bottom of a valley is the hills that you're surrounded by. What you're going to have to climb through to get out. And the lower you go, the bigger they look. The lower you are to the valley floor, the bigger the mountains look that you have to overcome. And when your perspective is framed by the low point and saying, as low as this is, those things so, seem so big. Can I tell you, we give more power to the hills than to the God who created those hills. You know what the name Elisha means? Elisha means God is salvation. So there's two men here with two very different perspectives. Gehazi is used to seeing things from the valley. Elisha is used to seeing things. God's going to show up. Every time he got yelled at by his mama, he was reminded, God is your salvation. Uh, God is salvation. Go take a shower. God is salvation. You better go back in there and wash those dishes. God is salvation. When the street lights come on, you better be at the dinner table. God is salvation. Good job on your report card. God is salvation. Did you do all your chores? If there's one thing Elisha grew up knowing, is it doesn't matter how big the hills look and how big the valley is, how big that army is, how mean it looks, how tough it looks, how overwhelming what in front of us looks like. The God who is our salvation is with us and greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. There is nothing. There is nothing that can stand against our God. This is not the end of our church. This is the beginning of a kingdom story. This is not an asterisk in the legacy of what God has done here. This is a testimony of what God will bring us through, what he will see us through, not just in us, but in the life of that young lady and in the life of Courtney and Quinetta Beard. And that one day we will all look back at this and we will say the enemy meant to destroy and God flipped it on its head and he turned it into the greatest testimony that could happen. That's my belief. That's my praise. That's my God. That's my church. The enemy messed with the wrong church. We don't shrink back. We don't cower. We don't hide. We are freedom strong, baby. We stand up. We rise. And we love well. We love well. We love well. We do it together. We do it together. And we will do it together. In fact, I'm going to ask you if you don't mind standing right now. Because I know God is stirring hearts right now. I know that the enemy has been busy. And I don't care about him because he's a defeated foe. But there are some things that he has brought back into some of our hearts. Things that happen. Things he's used as situation to stir up. And can I tell you this morning, those lies have to die in Jesus' name. Lies canceled in Jesus' name. Healing of old wounds that were never dealt with. 
healed in Jesus' name today, this morning. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to be available because right now we are going to enter a time where we invite Holy Spirit to show up and do what only he can do. And as we do that, I, wanna, I just want to share with you a testimony. I've been around church for a long time. I was called to ministry my senior year of high school. I was 17 years old when I gave myself to the, the work God wanted to do in my life. And I've been in it ever since. I've seen some ugly stuff. I've seen some horrible stuff. And I've seen churches handle it horribly wrong. And I've seen churches do it really awesome. But I'm going to tell you this right now. I have never seen what I've seen this past week. One, I've seen a church full of people who honored what I asked you to do, which was to not go to social media with this. Social media is a great place for a lot of things. It's not a great place to process your heart. You listened. I called one of my buddies. In fact, he's here, Fred. I love you, Fred. And you have no idea what it means to me to have the pastor of another church coming to stand with me at our church in this moment. And that says a lot about City Life Church. Chris, thank you. And so many others. But let me tell you, I called Fred and he said, I hadn't heard a thing, man. I had no clue. You know what that means? It means his ears weren't filled with people running around gossiping about something because they actually trusted the process. And that's you. So thank you. That's testimony. You see, when you put light on, darkness doesn't have room to do what it wants to do. You know what else has blessed my heart? You know the first thing people stop giving, doing during times like this is they stop financially supporting a church. And now more than ever, honestly, our San Antonio campus needs our generosity. They do. And can I just tell you, it blessed my soul that after that video that you watched last week, we had the largest financial offering that we have had the entire week, I mean the entire month. Like, you guys didn't say, oh, I'm going to step back. I don't know. You stepped forward and said, we're standing with you and with them. And whatever they need, we got to hire musicians. We got to hire, we got to travel down. So what? Here you go. I'm with you. Let's do it. But can I tell you the most powerful testimony that I experienced last week? It was a connect card. Actually, it was a covenant partner card. At San Antonio last week, as we handled this publicly, a woman decided that this is the church she wants to become a part of. She said, I've been in a lot of churches, but I have never been in a church that demonstrates the kingdom like this. I've visited for several weeks, but today I know this is the church where God has called me. I've seen a lot of people leave church in situations like this. I have never seen someone say, this is the kingdom, and I want to be a part of it. I am here, and I'm with you. Let's do this together. That's the God we serve. I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but I know it might feel like you're surrounded, but you're surrounded by him. It might feel like you're alone, but you're not. You got prayer partners right here, and you don't have to leave here without prayer. You don't have to leave here without processing. You don't have to leave here without walking through whatever God is stirring in your heart. But this is our declaration, that it might seem like we're surrounded, but we're surrounded by him. It might look like the enemy is big, but our God is bigger. And we will walk through this together. We will not just get through this together, but God will entrust us with more because we've shown them that we're willing to walk in integrity. So I don't know about you, but I want this to be my declaration. It might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by him. Father, in Jesus' name, would, we, would you just meet us in this moment? Whatever prayer needs to happen, whatever, whatever deliverance needs to happen, whatever healing needs to happen, right now, Lord, may we be a people who refuse to leave here without doing business with you, without bringing it to you, without joining our brothers and sisters right now. In Jesus' name, it may look like we're surrounded, but we declare today, Father God, we are surrounded by the God of more than enough. In Jesus' name, let's go. Can we sing that together? It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm come on, army of the Lord, let's raise that together. May look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Let this be your anthem of victory. May look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by I know how I'm surrounded. May look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Come on, let's
stay there. Let's raise it together. May look, may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. I know who's fighting for me. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Doesn't matter what you're surrounded by. It may look like I'm surrounded. Uh, 
so perfect. Um, one of the things that Pastor Freddie was preaching was this servant Gehazi uh, needed a change of perspective. But the only way he got that change of perspective was because Elisha was up before him. Was Elisha was on his knees before him. So I want us to do something really quick. I'll probably lose my job for this. I don't really care. Um, Pastor Freddie, if you don't mind coming up. Ms. Rev, if you don't mind coming up as well. It's so important, and this is, I'm not big on flattery or brown nosing or anything like that, but it's so important for us to honor our leaders. It's so important for us to do that. So important. Hey, uh, Pastor Fred, if you could come on up here. He's here. If our elders are here too, if we could just, let's surround them. Let's surround them. so many times in the scriptures awake when everyone else is asleep praying when everyone else is silent seeking you when everyone else is seeking after their own heart and their own way and their own selfish ambitions but never you never you we thank you that that through Freddie God and his leaders here that that we're finding some people on this earth that look a lot like you did when you were here walking 2,000 years ago. On their knees, praying, pouring themselves out, living a Philippians 2 life, always seeing others ahead of themselves. Father, we thank you that we find in them the character of Christ that inspires us to live better, to be more true. And we thank you, Father, that their example that is here today, that that we're witnessing isn't just for this church, but it's for the church. It's for the church. So I thank you for their courage. And we know, God, that in the weeks to come, that, that there's going to be moments where they're tired. And we pray, Father, that Elisha's mentor, Elijah, we think that moment where he came down from Mount Carmel and then he outraced horses and chariots. God, we pray that you would give them the strength that you gave Elijah to do the unbelievable to accomplish the remarkable and to bring your name glory in Jesus' name. Come on, and everybody said, amen.